Hi, I'm William Spaniel. Let's learn about international relations. Today's topic is absolute versus relative gains. This is actually something that we've been implicitly discussing throughout this unit on trade. It's just that our interests in this unit have so far been purely on economics and consumption and production and not about security relationships. However, it would be nice if we could integrate security with trade given the fact that we spent so much time in the last unit talking about conflict and we spent comparatively little time talking about trade here, but it would be good to see how these things will sort of interact with one another. And so specifically in this video, we're going to be interested in answering the question, how can international trade affect coercive bargaining? Now there's a positive side and a negative side here, and so I want to go through both different sides and explain why and how these two things will interact. So we know about the good side already. This is the idea that states like to trade with one another since trade creates something from nothing. That's the surplus where if we are specializing in what we're better at making compared to the other guy, we can actually create more stuff by trading with one another than we would be able to create if we were just consuming and producing on our own. So states make what we call an absolute gain here because more stuff exists for both parties. When there's that surplus around, there is more stuff to go around, and so there's an absolute terms, in absolute terms, more stuff. So consuming eight bottles of wine is better than consuming six bottles of wine, right? Eight bottles of wine in absolute terms is more than six bottles of wine is. That's pretty obvious. And so this actually means that consumption is positive sum, where if we are working together and working cooperatively with one another, we can actually produce more stuff. We can work together and get more stuff in terms of consumption. In contrast, when we're talking about security, we don't really see this idea that there's this positive sum here. Why is that? Well, security relationships are zero sum. Whatever you lose in territory is my gain, and whatever I gain in terms of territory is what you lose. And so whenever we're fighting a war, this is going to be completely relative. Power is a relative term, not an absolute term. This is a problem because that means relative gains are important in terms of security. So think about this in terms of two tanks. If I stole two tanks from the United States government right now, that doesn't really make me very powerful. Because think about it. The United States is a really strong country, and so if I were to drive two tanks around, I wouldn't get very far before I was arrested and thrown in jail. And likewise, even if I went somewhere else in the world, having two tanks doesn't actually buy me very much military power, given that everyone else has many more tanks. In contrast, if I could take these two tanks back into time and you know, run over the, Ro the Roman Empire, I would actually be fairly strong in those terms, because the strength of the Roman Empire compared to my two tanks is minimal. So whenever we're talking about power here, we can't just be looking at what one person has. We have to be looking at how or what both people have or both sides have and compare those two. And that's why this power relationship, the security relationship is zero sum. Whatever strength I have is strength that you don't have. And whatever strength you have is strength that I don't have. There isn't any sort of mutual gain in terms of strength. Now, this is a problem because trade can sometimes turn these absolute gains into relative gains, and the relative gains then have all sorts of security problems associated with them. So how can trade sometimes be bad? Well, let's look at an example and let's go back to those consumption and production charts that we've been looking at all along in this unit, where California in this example with no trade is consuming five bottles of wine and two bottles of tequila, and Mexico is consuming one bottle of wine and four bottles of tequila. This is again without any sort of trade. And if California and Mexico were in contrast to work together and trade with one another and specialize in what they're better at making, then consumption after trade might look like this instead, where California is now consuming eight bottles of wine and four bottles of tequila. That's up from five and two in this consumption without trade. And Mexico is also making a slight gain here. It's going to consume an extra bottle of wine. And it's going to consume the same amount of tequila. Now, this is an example of one of those trade agreements, which is relatively more beneficial to one party than the other. California is actually getting a lot of the surplus here, and Mexico is getting very little of the surplus. So how can that be a problem? Well, we might be thinking about this in terms of fun and games when we're having wine and tequila as an example, but in reality, what this wine and tequila is representing is extra wealth for California. California is being made richer comparative to Mexico through trade. 
California is making all sorts of extra money by having three bottles of extra wine and two bottles of extra tequila, and Mexico is only getting one bottle of extra wine, and so that's a relative difference that's pretty sizable. California is doing very well here, and Mexico is not. And so the problem is that California, being disproportionately rich now, well, California might do something bad. Mexico has to be worried that California will take its relative advantage in trade and turn it into a relative advantage in security by taking all of that extra money and investing in weapons. And once California has guns and bombs, it can turn those guns and bombs, point them toward Mexico, and demand security issues out of Mexico. So the easiest example here is California could demand extra territory from Mexico. California could demand to redraw the border between California and Mexico to give California more territory than it would have beforehand. And this is something that Mexico has to be worried about in a world where security is really paramount, that California's relative gains in trade will turn into relative gains in security and then affect Mexico negatively. Now, this is not to say that trade becomes impossible when we have this sort of security issue. Trade is still possible. It's just that you have to be really careful about how you balance it. So the way you can balance it appropriately is to make sure that the relative gains that are potential in terms of the security relationship by having trade are offset by the absolute advantages of the increased production of trade. So if you have an equitable distribution in trade, for example, then you don't have to worry about the security relationship issue. It's only a matter of when you don't have these equitable gains and you have one side gaining more than another, that sort of agreement might not be acceptable to one state. And so you might have to force these sorts of trade agreements to be more equitable among security rivals. Now, it's interesting to note here that this only really applies to states that are actually really intensely bitter rivals. So, for example, the United States and Canada don't have to worry about these sorts of issues when they're coming up with trade agreements, because even if California, or rather, even if Canada makes relative gains and is making out like a bandit in terms of trade, it's getting all of the surplus compared to the United States, the United States isn't really worried that Canada is going to take that surplus and turn it into a relative military gain and then try to invade the United States or something like that. You know, the United States and California, I keep saying California instead of Canada, the United States and Canada have mutual respect with one another and mutual interest with one another. And there is no intense security relationship between the United States and Canada. So we don't have to be worried about those sorts of issues when we're trading with one another. That's in contrast to, for example, the United States trading with Iran, where the United States has to be worried that if Iran is making out like a bandit in this trade agreement or in a trade agreement and leaving Iran in a better position economically than it would be had there not been trade, that the United States has to be worried that the Iranians would then take that extra power or extra money and turn it into relative military strength, which is then bad for the United States. So that's only an issue that actually becomes important when you have an intense security relationship. It's not so problematic when you don't. All right, that wraps up this unit on trade. I think it was important, and I think it was an interesting little diversion away from conflict, but as we go into the next unit, we will be talking about conflict once again. The trade stuff will pop up again, and that's why we have been doing it in this unit, but actually in the next unit, our focus is going to be taking that unitary actor assumption that we've been working with both in the conflict unit from the previous unit and this unit on trade, and we're going to be breaking down the state into multiple actors and see we're going to see how domestic politics can affect international relations. And it's going to be really interesting, and I hope to see you in that unit. Until then, take care. Bye now.